Spring 2020 Senior Design Group 2 Optically Transmitted Point-to-Point -point Secure Audio Transceiver The Vibraphone The team members are myself, James Ottaway, Photonic Science and Engineering Hello, I'm Hannah, Photonic Science and Engineering I'm Luke Daniel, an Electrical Engineering student from the College of Engineering and Computer Science at UCF Hello, I'm Jordan Nazario, and I'm an electrical engineering major. So the motivation for the fiber phone is to use fiber for enhanced security for communicating about classified material in environments where communication with the outside is restricted. Um, our system allows conferencing between two secure locations, which saves travel time for employees and adds convenience while maintaining security. This is James again. Let's start with a short system overview. The fiber phone is a speakerphone which transmits its signal using light through an optical fiber pair, as opposed to typical wired or wireless communication devices. This is done to increase security and ensure privacy of the conversation by reducing eavesdropping opportunities across the transmission line. Essentially, there's no omnidirectional radio frequency transmitted or a tappable transmission available for nefarious agents. The Fiberphone is a low-cost, high-reliability device, and each of the components within the device were chosen to ensure it an extended longevity and the continual performance for call durations. The sound quality of the Fiberphone is comparable to a standard telephone with a targeted response of plus minus 3 dB over the conversation vocal range, about 200 to 4 kHz, and its sound noise ratio is about 50 dB. Here we have a diagram of the primary subsystems of the Fiberphone and what it uses to handle its call. For model mode, either device can initiate a call, sending a signal to the second device, where the second user will answer the call. Once the connection is established, the two-way conversation can begin. And since the system has a dedicated fiber optic for each side of the conversation, there is no interference in the bidirectional signal transmitted. And of course, either device should be able to disconnect the call at any time. With the subsystems identified, the team members had their responsibilities defined. With myself handling the primary responsibilities of the transmitter and receiver fiber coupling, and the circuit layout and building, as well as the analog system, Hannah provided critical support for that system, as you can see on the chart. She also had primary responsibility of the digital signal development and research and the transmitter signal amplification circuit. Luke was primarily responsible for the PCB design and the microcontroller and its programming and Jordan was responsible for the power system and audio amplification. Many of the responsibilities overlapped or utilized critical input from multiple team members. Full team meetings were held twice a week through the semester prior to campus shutdown and ensured everyone was aware of where the project and systems were in development and testing and what we each could do to support the team. Hello, I'm Jordan, and for the next couple slides, I'll be talking about constraints, standards, and specifications. This slide shows our system constraints. These constraints include things like having to operate at room temperature, safety standards, and our limits as students. This slide shows the standards that we use to make sure that our device could be operated and distributed in the US. These standards also provide some tests to put our device through to make sure everything is functioning properly. And on this slide, we have the specifications that we set for our device like not losing more than 25 decibels per kilometer in our fiber, or having a signal delay of no more than 10 milliseconds. I'm Hannah, and now I'm going to talk about the communication subsystem, the digital version. So we had a tough decision about choosing analog or digital, but originally we had chosen digital for better quality, higher performance, and just a more standard telephone system. However, digital is a lot more complex than analog with the addition of A to D, D to A conversion, and other factors um, that weighed on our decision. But first I'm going to talk about the digital system. So here's the block diagram for the digital communication system. The diagram shows a one-way communication link, but our system goes uh, both ways. Now I will focus on the digital component, the codec. The purpose of the codec in our system is to digitally encode and decode 
our signal and perform analog to digital and digital to analog conversion. We are also looking for a codec that had uh, an evaluation module, our desired sampling rate, as well as uh, filtering, automatic gain control, and a speaker driver. And here in highlighted is the one we chose which meets all of those parameters. The EVM software, or the evaluation software, we used to configure the chip, um, change different parameters of its performance, and optimize sound quality. The software was pretty complicated to use in order to both transmit and receive on the same chip, but we did succeed with this over a wire connection. Uh, however, we also discovered the much higher bit rate than we anticipated of uh, 1.4 megahertz, which made designing our circuitry a challenge. Here is an example of our receiver response uh, versus the transmitter response for the optical digital transmission. Uh, we have had better results than this where we were able to detect every individual pulse, but there was significant distortion on the pulse shape, which uh, really was very detrimental to the intelligibility of the signal. Uh, we attempted to solve this problem with a comparator and um, modifying values, but ultimately we had to switch to analog transmission. And now I'm going to talk about the analog version of our communication subsystem. So for our photodetector selection, we chose a PIN photodiode instead of an avalanche one because it's cheaper and avalanche is only for very high sensitivity applications. We also needed something with an 850 nanometer peak wavelength to match the transmitter, as well as something that was reasonable in cost and had a, a usable form factor. We chose the MTD5010N, which met these parameters. Test results of our photodetector showed that it should respond well at our anticipated bit rate which ended up being much higher, and also that the photodetector would respond well to analog signals. So here is the analog communications system uh, block diagram, obviously a bit simpler than the digital one, but the main change was to add the microphone preamplifier and buffer and eliminate the codec. The receiver is the same one that was used in the digital system. We developed the analog transmitter circuit using documentation from Texas Instruments and uh, adjusted the values to fit our system and made a few modifications. Uh, we needed um, the microphone preamplifier to amplify the microphone uh, voltage. We needed uh, a modification in order to have a bias voltage on the LED since we're modulating with a small signal. That uh, bias voltage can be seen around our 7 and R8 on the diagram where we're adding that. Um, we needed the voltage buffer because an LED is a current controlled device and our initial amplifier does not produce high enough current to power the LED. The receiver circuit was also developed using a uh, design from Texas Instruments. It's a trans impedance amplifier which means it's converting the current signal from the photodiode into a voltage signal which can be used to feed to our um, speaker or speaker amplifier. Um, this was originally designed for the digital system, so it has high frequency response or higher frequency response along with the lower frequency response. However, it works uh, very well for the analog range as well, and the output is being sent to a speaker amplifier. For the signal source and coupling systems, we evaluated two optical signal sources of 850 nanometer high power LEDs and laser diodes, specifically Vixels. 850 nanometers was chosen because of its compatibility with existing optical fibers and effective transmission through industry standard OM3 or OM4 optical cables. The low voltage and low power requirements of the Vixel provided compelling reasons to use. However, the greater output stability, longer life, and lower cost than the high emittance infrared LEDs convinced the team to select the LED as the signal source. Also, the LED's consistent power output across the expected system operation temperatures greatly influenced our decision. With a selected LED, we characterized the output with a test circuit to compare the laboratory performance to published data sheets. 
While we were unable to achieve the published maximum power with a wide-angle admittance metering station, a respectable 47 milliwatt output was measured. It is also worth noting that we are able to observe and confirm a linear response in the LED's output power, which is the desired performance for analog transmission and would, of course, support digital communication very well. A little bit of math later and we can resolve the optical power budget and evaluate the responsivity requirements of a photodetector. The 2 meter patch cables coupling the units to subterranean fiber optic cables have a negligible attenuation along their length. Since the data rate is reasonably slow and the transmission distance is reasonably short, chromatic dispersion is also negligible. The 30 nanometer bandwidth of the LED should cause very little modal dispersion also. Again, due to the reasonably short length of the fiber system, the graded index patch cable can arguably provide some assistance in reducing the modal dispersion also. Even the power attenuation along the 2 km subterranean cable is relatively small when compared to the potential loss at each coupling. So the design intent was to minimize the coupling power loss into the optical cable. Very briefly, but coupled signal source to fiber systems are cheap and easy to implement but cause substantial loss, especially when considering losses from fiber and source misalignment. The LED source area is about 283,000 square microns, which is plenty large enough to align with the 50 micron diameter fiber core, about 2,000 square microns. But an LED transmits in every direction, and the further the source is away from the fiber, the inverse square law shows us how quickly the light power falls. Consequently, most of the emitted power is wasted and not usable for signal strength. An ideal 4F optical system would provide a greater amount of light into the core of the fiber and provide excellent signal strength. However, this too is tricky, as the lenses have to be aligned exactly parallel to each other, exactly perpendicular to the axis of the fiber and the emitter, and exactly at the focal length from point source and fiber core. Even a collimating system would fail if one of these alignments was misaligned. And all of these adjustments are happening on the millimeter scale and lower, complicating the process even more. A ball lens, on the other hand, removes the need for multi-lens alignment and tuning as well as removing the need for lens perpendicularity to the axis of the fiber, leaving only the longitudinal and the axial alignments to control for optimal coupling. The ball lens also arguably collects an effectively larger area of light as praxial limits never come into play for the non-imaging sub-millimeter scale of the signal source to fiber path. So locking a ball lens at the focal length of both the emitter and fiber leave only the axial alignment of source and fiber core to be addressed for achieving the greatest coupling efficiency. So we designed an inexpensive coupling system to work with the standard patch cable couplers, LC and SC, to both lock the ball lens at its focal length and provide axial alignment from source to fiber core. After a few tests on machining facility tolerances, the team was able to select a duplex LC coupling system on which to base the final design. First, the LC duplex adapter is modified with the permanently affixed photodetector socket shown as a cross-section in this illustration, but is completely covering the photodetector in the built version. The photodetector is locked into position about one half of a millimeter from the end of the incoming fiber optic cable. A locking block then holds the photodetector in place and prevents the anode and cathode from shorting with a separating tab and an air gap to the photodetector cathode shell. And on the signal transmitter half of the duplex adapter, a shafted fiber coupler is fit into the clipped bracket assembly. The shaft fully surrounds the last centimeter of the patch fiber, holding it axially aligned within the mount. The 5mm diameter ball lens is held in place with o-rings and inserted into the socket, and the lens housing is screwed to the socket adapter. The threaded assembly holds the lens securely and allows adjustment by tightening or loosening the assembly for about 3 tenths of a millimeter in each direction based on the threading size. The signal LED is inserted on axis and then held in place with an o-ring, and the final assembly cover is screwed in place, again isolating the component leads to prevent shorting. And this is the built system ready to be assembled and attached to the optical cables. And then, COVID-19 became the safety concern for all of us. We worked hard to test the system and extract a signal from the coupled fiber similar to the predicted in the paraxial models in ZMAX. As you can imagine, it's difficult to measure submillimeter distances or optical power output without correct laboratory equipment. Already having the data for pre-coupled signal power let us know we were capable of providing and coupling power into the fiber. But very little data was collected on the power exiting the fiber, with the preliminary results ranging from about 10 to 20 dB loss, 11 millimeters from the fiber core. So, 
it was determined that the emitted light from the core of the fiber was not illuminating enough surface of the photodetector to register a reasonable signal for reception. When makeshift lensing solutions failed, we decided to select a Toslink, an optical audio cable, to use as a transmission fiber. Its 1 mm diameter core is significantly larger than the 50 micron diameter of the multimode fiber. And even with the significant increase in attenuation through a plastic fiber, the signal strength of the photodetector was sufficient for the signal to be received. I'm Luke and I'll be covering the microcontroller and call procedure functions. We use the STM32 platform for our microcontroller due to the cost being half as much as any MSP430 that would work for the system. Additionally, the draw to this development board was the low voltage requirement that matched with the 5 volts necessary for our amplifiers in the system, which meant we could reuse our rectifier design to power the board. The STM32 also has a great online community which was used as technical support when starting development of the firmware for our microcontroller. This flowchart covers the general call procedure that the microcontroller is handling. The system starts when the caller presses the button and a signal is sent to the receiver. From there, an LED will light indicating that a call is waiting and the system then acts like a standard telephone with either side being able to end the call at any point. Before any work could be done on the algorithm to handle the call functionality, the microcontroller itself would need to be configured. In order to keep the system simple enough to easily debug later on, the same clock speed would be used throughout the system. Additionally, a majority of the communication between the two microcontrollers would be using the GPIO functionality of the pen. By using this functionality, the same procedure for sending a signal could be used to enable the indicator LEDs and send the enable signal to the MOSFET circuit. Due to this simplification, much of the functionality of the system can be achieved by using the HAL read and write pin functions that are included in the HAL library that is supported by the STM32 natively. Additionally, a data buffer was used in order to store the current state of the system to reduce any improper changes in the pins when the button is pressed by the user. The final code was broken into basic blocks that match up with what was shown in the flowchart earlier. The reset state is where the system begins on startup and whenever the current call is finished. It resets all the values of the pin so that no voice signal is being transmitted between the two devices. From there, if the button is pressed, the initiate call signal is sent to the other device and the buffer is set to active. The next block becomes active whenever the buffer is active, but the caller is yet to receive an answer from the other device. The point of this block is to serve as a means for the caller to cancel their call. In the top right, when the system receives this call signal, it will light the call ready LED and wait for the user to press the button, effectively answering the call and setting the buffer on receive to active. This leaves the final block, which is where both systems will end up once the receiver has pressed their button. The same procedure for hanging up from the caller side is repeated in this block as well. The circuit on the left was the initial design that we were going to use in order to disable the voice signal. But while implementing the circuit into the device, there was a loading issue with the resistor that was being used to control the current being sent to the transmitter LED. This meant that no matter what the state of the MOSFET was, the signal was still being sent to the LED. In order to accomplish the switching, without having to wait for additional components to arrive, the design was quickly changed to the one on the right, with the algorithm used by the microcontroller having to be swapped as under the new design, the signal for the LED is enabled when the MOSFET is receiving a high enable signal rather than a low one. For our PCB design, the goal was to include the audio codec and the STM32 on the same board, as well as include some of the power system and the output amplifiers. The initial design had quite a few issues, such as not considering how we were going to solder the components onto the board. Specifically, the microcontroller and the codec, which use very small pins, and we had to bring in a local manufacturer in order to get them soldered. Additionally, due to the coding for the STM32 being incomplete at the time of the design, the pins that were being used were incorrect. Considerations for fixing these issues had already begun when the university announced the shutdown of campus and the following removal of the PCB requirement. With that in mind, our focus shifted to getting the system as functional as possible using the development boards only, with our limited ability to work while in isolation. Hello, it's Jordan again, and now I'll be talking about our power system. This flowchart shows the general idea behind our power system. How we're drawing power from the wall outlet through the adapter into different regulators within our device to power our system. The wall adapter shown on this slide 
is the wall adapter that we use when making our device. We knew that the max voltage level needed by a single component in our device was 15 volts, and another component would need around 250 milliamps of current flowing through it. There were many wall adapters that fit the 15 volt output bill, but out of all of them, this one provided a 1 ampere output for current, while others provided significantly more. To avoid getting something that would be seen as overkill, we chose this one. Two voltage regulators displayed on this slide are responsible for getting the final values to where they need to be. The R1D regulator is a dual output regulator that takes an input of 15 volts and produces an output of positive and negative 15 volts, making it ideal for supplying rails for op amps. The LM1117 is an adjustable regulator that outputs anywhere from 1.35 volts to 16 volts. It's also able to output as much as 800 milliamps of current, so it more than covers the current and voltage needs for our components. Here we have the circuit diagram for the LM1117, showing how the circuit will need to be built in order to properly adjust the output voltage of the regulator. This slide also shows physical versions of the circuit that will be used in our device. This slide shows the circuit diagram for the bulk of our power system. Up on top of the diagram, we have the R1D regulator that's directly providing the rails for the op amp that will be helping to power our light strip, as well as producing a negative input for one of our LM1117 regulators to produce the negative rail for our audio amplifiers. The rest of the circuit is comprised of LM1117 regulators that will be providing the remaining voltages for the rest of the components in our device including 3.3 volts for the microcontroller, 5.5 volts for the positive rail of the audio amplifiers, and 10 volts for the photodetector. I will now switch to talking about our budget and our timeline. The original budget for producing both of our speakerphone devices was $500, and unfortunately, we have gone over that budget by $70, with a total amount spent of $570. This slide shows the original timeline we set for ourselves to produce our device. Unfortunately, due to early delivery issues and other unforeseen complications, we were not able to keep with this timeline, but the end result still ends with us still having a complete and functioning device. Thanks for listening, and we look forward to seeing you at the final presentation.